We're going to continue looking at the Midrashim about Esav and Yaakov, but we have also to look at the, at the text of the Tanakh to see what the Torah says about that. So, we know that uh, when Yitzhak tells Esav, I want to give a bracha, Rivka calls Yaakov and says, you go and you take the bracha. And I raised, we raised the question last time, why didn't she tell Yitzhak outright, I think that Yaakov is the one. And why didn't she ever tell him about the prophecy? And I said, we said probably it's because she felt that she wouldn't be listened to. And so she would rather do it this way. Um, now the question is, what, what was Yaakov's reaction? Was Yaakov willing or unwilling to do that? So it's obvious from the Pasuk that his first reaction was, uh, was negative. He said, I don't want to do that. Why? He says, in Isava he ish sa'il, vanuhi ish halak. He says, I'm, my skin is smooth, my, my brother is hairy. If, he says, ulayim musheni avi, veiti be'anav kim ta'ate ave, veiti alay kelay velo berachai. He says, if my, if my father feels my, my, my body, if he just touches me, he will know that I'm uh, trying to deceive him and I will get a curse instead of a blessing. It's a very, Rational argument. The rabbis took it to the Midrash to a deeper level and they say, Ulai Yemusheni Avi, they read, Halevai Yemusheni Avi, meaning not, I'm afraid that he will touch me, but rather, I wish he will touch me and find out. Meaning, what he tells Rivka that is that he is torn between her and between his father. He wants to do what she tells him, but he doesn't want to deceive his father. So he says, I wish that he finds out this way, I'm not the one telling on you. But, um, the other question here is, why didn't Yaakov go to his father and say, I'm the, I'm the firstborn, give me the bracha. Right? He should have told him, if you already, I mean, not that I'm the firstborn, meaning I bought the right of the firstborn for my son. <clears throat> so I want the blessing as well. So, one of two things. Either he felt that whatever he did with, with Asav would not, would not go well, would not sit well with Yitzhak. Yitzhak would not be happy with that because you cannot sell the right of the firstborn. He more, he did it as just to, to see um, Asav's intention or that the Bechorah and the Beracha were not related. The Bechorah, the right of the firstborn, was something that would only be realized when Yitzhak dies. And that's about inheritance. It's not about the bracha. The, the blessing is not the blessing of the firstborn. This is, we, we, we usually associate it with that. But it has nothing to do with that. It's Yitzhak chooses what to bless Esau with and what to bless Yaakov with. And he wanted this specific blessing which would make him the leader. This is what Rivka had in mind. It had nothing to do with the bechora, with the right of the firstborn. That's why he doesn't tell his father ever, I purchased the Bechora and therefore I deserve the blessing as well. And that's why also Isav, when Isav finds out that he's been deceived, he said, he tricked me twice. He took my Bechora, the right of the firstborn, and now he took the Bechora as well. Meaning there are two separate issues. It's not the same thing. So his mother says, no, listen, don't worry, your curse will be on me. I'm the one to, I, if there would be a curse, I will carry the burden of the curse. And again, this is something that the Midrash notes that uh, she says, Alai, Kirat Chavni, your curse will be on me. The word is that he, she uses is Alai. Many, many years later, when Yaakov reflects on his life, he says, Alai, Hayu Kulana, it was all on me. What is Kulana? All, all these. He says, Yosef was taken away from me. Shimon was imprisoned by the viceroy, which he didn't know was Yosef. And now you're going to take Binyamin. Alai, are you Kulana? All these ble- uh, curses, losing my children, it's, it all came on me. So one of the commentators on the, on the Midrash says, this is a reflection of what, Rahel, of what Rivka says. Rivka told him, don't worry, the curse will be on me. Many years later, he says, no, it wasn't on you, it was on me. Meaning that, that you know, how people say, don't worry, do that, I'm responsible. No, at the end of the day, we are responsible for our actions. This is the message 
of the Pasuk. Yaakov cannot clear himself of fault by saying, my mother told me to do that. It was his responsibility. <clears throat> so what happens? He brings, he brings the food, I mean, he brings the, the, the goats, and she slaughters them, she cooks them, she gives it to him, and he goes to his father, and he goes and he says, Vayomer aviv, Vayomer hineni mi atabini. He says, here I am. And the father says, who are you? And obvious question, what do you mean, who are you? He says, mi atabini, right? Who are you? My son. Why would Yitzhak think that this is not Aesav? He told his, he, he called about an hour ago, two hours, we don't know how long it took, maybe two, three hours, right? He called his son Aesav and he says, go, get me, uh, go for some game and get me uh, food. And now someone comes into the, into the tent with food, it smells delicious, and he says, father, why would it be Yaakov and not Aesav? Obviously it's Aesav. Why the question? The voice. the voice, right. So Yaakov says, I am Aesav, your firstborn. I did as you told me. Please get up and sit and eat what I brought you. And Yitzhak says, come here, I want to feel you, whether you are Aesav or not. Again, he casts doubt on him. He says, I'm not sure that you are Aesav. So Yaakov comes closer and he touches him and he says, it's funny. The voice is like Yaakov, and the hands are the hands of Aesav. And again he says, is, are you my son Aesav? He says, yes. Ani. He says, give me the food. After he feeds him, he says, come and kiss me. Like he wants me to, to feel him closer. He, he, he hugs him. He says, the, the smell of, the, of, of your garments is the smell of the field, because he loved the, the outdoors, maybe... Yitzhak, as he was losing his eyesight, felt that he's restricted to the tent, and he missed the, the, uh, the smell of the great outdoor. But we'll see that the Midrash sees this whole thing of the smell differently. But the, the question here is, what, it's true that, that Yitzhak recognized Yaakov by his voice, that his voice was distinct. But not only his voice, also his manner of speech which the rabbis uh, mention out in the Midrash, ya- Yaakov, it's a subtle word. Uh, first Yaakov says, Hikra Adonai Elohecha Lefanai. Adonai, your God, brought the, the food to me. It was, it was a miracle. God help me. And, but he also speaks very politely. He says, please, Yakum Kumna Sheva, please, Rise and, and, and settle down in a way that you're comfortable eating. But when Isav comes in, Isav says, Yakum avi ve'yochal mitzed beno. Ba'avur tevarachani nefshecha. Right? Yakum avi, like, get up and eat. Ba'avur tevarachani nefshecha. So the subtle differences. The question, the real question is, Isav and Yaakov grew up together for years. And they were twins. Probably had a similar voice. Even brothers who are not twins or sisters or not twins, have similar voice. I have it all the time. I have two brothers. When I, when I got married, and my, my brother would call home, he would have to say, Edna, it's, it's Yuda. So she doesn't start telling him, you know, hi, honey, how are you? Or something like that. <laughs> <coughs> because several times she says, oh, hi. <coughs> so, so, would be very easy for Yaakov to imitate Isav's voice and his manner of speech. He knows exactly how he talks. Very easy for brothers, easier for twins. Why didn't he do that? I think the answer is the same thing that he tells his mother. What if, what if, my, what if my father finds out? And the rabbi said he wishes, he wishes that, he, that he, his father finds out. Yaakov got stuck in between his mother and his father. His mother wants him to trick his father. And he feels that it's a dishonest thing to do. He cannot defy his mother. So one, one option is to go in and go to his dad and he says, Abba, it's not me. I mean, I'm, it's not Isav. The truth is I'm Yaakov. But mom forced me to do it. Right? That could have worked. Except for Rivka, probably just as she heard when Ishaq was talking to, to Isav, how did she hear? 
she's standing there all the time. She's constantly watching because she's the she's the hovering mom. She's always trying to protect Yaakov. She's eavesdropping. So she follows him, go, go, go with the food, go with the food. And I'm standing, she stands at the, at the opening of the tent to see how things unfold. Maybe to, to help him with this problem. So he can't walk in and says, mom told me to do it, I'm sorry, here's the food, I'm walking away. Because she's there, he's going to go, go back, you know, from the, uh, from the, from the frying pan to the, to the fire. So he comes in, and he plays by her book, with a little twist where he does not change his voice. And his father says, who are you? He says, he says, He says more than what he has to say. I did as you told me. God, help me. Please get up. He waits for him to say, you're not Isav. And But still he says, oh, it's, come here, let me feel you. He says, this, your voice sounds different. So Yaakov said, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, you know, just one more thing, say, you know, expose me and I'll be happy. He doesn't do that. Now, the question also, Yitzhak had doubts. Why did he go on? Because I saw Yitzhak also felt, we could say, in a way, in the, he's in the moment, he's in the zone. He was getting ready to give a beracha. Now he's ready to give the beracha and... and he doesn't. He asks up until a certain limit, and then he says, "Okay, whoever it is right now, that's the person to get the bracha." So Yaakov uh, eventually lost the opportunity to expose himself because he wasn't willing to say out loud. So I think that also explains something very interesting that we say uh, appears in some of the literature in Kabbalah. Yaakov is identified with midat haemet, with the the, the the character, character trait or the sefirah in, in Kabbalah, which is identified with Yaakov, is emet, truth. And when you look at this story, you say, how can Yaakov be identified with truth? If he started his career by misleading his father, and then later on he got entangled with Lavan, another uh, web of mischief and, 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 and lies from Lavan, then he had to tr- trick him back. How can he say, titan emet le'akov? Uh, I mean, it's based on the pasuk. You will give loving kindness to Abraham and truth to Yaakov. So I think the answer is that Yaakov was truly an honest person. But, and he wanted to be, as we say, be true to yourself. The question, the problem is when you have more than one self, like in this case, as a, as a son, he is obligated to himself or, the, or maybe the divine truth. He is obligated to his mother. He is obligated to his father. So he tried to sort of navigate between all of them without saying anything, doing what his mother wanted, doing what his father wanted without uh, incriminating anyone. And God teaches him by life experience that it doesn't work that way. You have sometimes to take a stand and to make a decision and to say... Like he had to tell his mother, I'm not going to do that. Or after she sent him in to tell his father, I'm not a Saif, I'm Yaakov. The moment he didn't say that, everything started rolling against him. You realize Yaakov's life was not happy. He had to run away from his brother. He lost the opportunity to be with his mother and his father. His father-in-law cheated him in the same way that he cheated his father. And every time Yaakov runs into one kind, one of these deceptions, the, the concept of clothes, of garments, and of goats resurfaces. Because he cheated his father by dressing up, right? And by bringing goats. Now the word beged in Hebrew, cloth or garment, comes from the same root as bagad, to betray. So betrayal... And clothes are related for the very simple reason that we can de- deceive people by dressing in a, in a different way, right? You put a uniform, you're a policeman. You put a, a cloak, you become a priest or, or a rabbi, whatever it is. So, yeah, what happens to the, the next deception that we find? Yosef's brothers throw him to the pit. He disappears. And then they slaughter a goat. And they dip the garment in the blood and they send it to Yaakov, like saying, there you go. 
you deceived your father with the garment and with the goats, we deceive you with the garment and the goat. Then later on Yehuda uh, breaks away with his brothers because of this whole story. We'll get there. And then he is enticed by Tamar, his daughter-in-law. And she dresses up. And what does she take? What does she say will be the the payment for her services? A goat. Again, the 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 garments and the goats. When eventually the brothers come to visit Yaakov, Yosef, they don't recognize him because he dresses <coughs> differently. So all through his life, Yaakov gets reminders saying what you did was wrong and you have to make up for it. So <coughs> it's a message to us <coughs> that like, as we say, when we have such a dilemma, we can't, we can't avoid it by not taking a stand. One thing must be done uh, in, a, in a decisive manner. Um, finally, I will, now that we spoke about Begadim, I'll, I'll mention this Midrash. It's an interesting Midrash that the Begadim that Isav had, the special Begadim uh, that Rivka kept at home, is called Begadim Isav Bena Hamudot, were, they said that he had precious clothes. They were so precious that Rivka's mother kept it at home. So according to the Midrash, those were the, were the garments that he stole from Nimrod. Nimrod, in turn, stole them from Cain, who got them from Adam. Adam got those, uh, uh, first, Adam Arishon got those garments from God. There's a Kotnot Or, when Elohim made for Adam and Ishto Kotnot Or, and Bishem, was made, made of leather or, or hide, it's not clear. Um, so the message in the Midrash, Midrash says when, when, when uh, Yaakov came in and Isaf sm- Yitzhak smelled his garment, he says, the, the smell like the field of God, he meant Gan Eden, because the smell of Gan Eden was there. But I think also symbolically, it means that the, the sin of Adam Arishon was also deception. There was, it was self-deception. Adam and his wife deceived themselves by saying, we're doing the right thing without acknowledging that they're really falling for their desire. And what do they get <coughs> as a... As a <laughs> so, uh, so what Adam... And his wife got as a <laughs> as a result. They got a big to to uh, symbolize that they're having uh, they covering up for their betrayal with begadim. But God says, don't use the regular begad. The regular begad, like I said, comes from the word betrayal. He makes for them kutnot all. All is hide, but also skin. Like it's the, the message is that we should be honest and transparent because it becomes like a second skin. It becomes your real person. You're not covering up for your personality with your garment. So at the end of the day, the message here is that we really have to be honest and speak truth. <laughs>